Good afternoon, attendees in person and online. Welcome to the afternoon session, Urban Representations, Visions and Actions. Hello, my name is Dehi Kwok, and I'm, I am an Associate Professor of Sport Management in the School of Kinesiology, and also a faculty member at NAM Center. Congratulations to Sammy and Francisco Youngju uh, for, for putting this wonderful conference together. I was streaming online in the morning session, and uh, it was fascinating to hear about Dongdaemun Stadium and Dongdaemun Design Plaza. Because of my uh, major, I, was, I remember vividly going to Dongdaemun Stadium to cheer for my high school baseball team and my uh, undergraduate baseball team, which they never won a single game in their entire history. But I remember going to the Dongdaemun Stadium, so I was one of the, those uh, who were saddened by the demolition of the Dongdaemun Stadium. So I, I was able to relate to that. Um, since Kelsey asked me to make the introduction brief, so I'll jump right into introducing our wonderful panel, uh, panel for this session. First speaker is Bruce Fulton. Bruce is an associate professor in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia, uh, Columbia and the inaugural holder of the Youngbin Min Chair in Korean Literature and Literary tr Translation. I just learned that his Korean name is Woo Jin Ho. Uh, uh, Woo Jin Ho uh, offers instruction in Korean to English literary, literary translation and both tradition and modern Korean literature. His research interests lie in modern Korean fiction and its translation, intertextuality intertext and intermediality in Korean literature past and present, and non-mainstream Korean literature such as women's literature, military camp town uh, fiction, and the literature of the Korean diaspora. Today, Bruce will be presenting From, the, uh, from Community to Anonymity, uh, Images of the Metropolis in Modern Korean Fiction. Our next speaker is Jung Hoon Shin, an assistant professor of art history and theory of art at Seoul National University. Some of his selected publications include Korean Art and the City After Min Jung Art, Reality and Utterance in and Against Min Jung Art, 1970 Osaka Expo Korea Pavilion, State Architects Earning to be Contemporary, and many more. His publications all were also featured in numerous outlets such as Journal of Architecture, Journal of Architectural Education, and many more. Today, Jung Hoon will be presenting Network and the Primitive, Visionary Planning Toward the Year 2000 by Human Environmental Development Institute. Our third presenter for this session is Christina Horn. She's a PhD student in the University of California, Irvine's East Asian Studies Department with a graduate emphasis in visual studies. She received her BA in history from the University of Delaware and her MA in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from the University of Pennsylvania. Her research addresses the representation of kinship and maternity in contemporary South Korean cinema with a focus on the rise of alternative family structures. Today, Krishna will present Reclaiming Seoul Through Running Man, South Korean Television and Urban Spaces. Last but not least, Jeannie Kim Watson, Associate Professor of English from New York University, will be the discussion for this wonderful panel. Looking forward to learning and reflecting more about urban representations from various perspectives. Please welcome our first speaker, Wu Jin Ho. Uh, it is indeed refreshing to be back in person when you get to be my age of 73 you begin to hear voices running through your mind and one of the voices I'm hearing now is JYP Park Jin Young when he talks about the Wonder Girls we're back so <laughs> In fact, this is the first in-person conference I've attended since the conference here almost exactly two years ago, which I was privileged to attend. So once again, I'd like to join the others in thanking Sammy and Francisco for making it possible to be here. I think it's essential that in just about any conference involving Korean studies, it's necessary to have a literary representation, so to speak, and I think back to the 1990s when uh, our anthology hour, meaning my good wife, Ju Chan Fulton, and the late Marshall Peel, when we published Land of Exile, Contemporary Korean Fiction, and my good friend and colleague and fellow former U.S. Peace Corps in Korea, 
um, scholar Mike Robinson said in a review that works of modern Korean fiction open a window onto modern Korean history, society, culture, and history that no history textbook can hope to do. So um, as, a, as someone uh, who specializes in Korean literature and literary translation, I'm very happy to be part of this significant conference. I need to apologize to Professor Watson, our discussant, for what uh, I'm sure she has found to be a very disjointed uh, presentation. It, it is very much a work in progress. Uh, after I sent in the abstract, I realized almost immediately I had bit off a lot more than I can chew because there are numerous, numerous dozens of distinctive fictional representations of the city in modern Korean, in, in the almost 100 years of, uh, of modern Korean fiction. And my, um, what I'm going to focus on, as the title of my presentation indicates, is the shift from uh, conceptions of neighborhood in, in the metropolis to a uh, much more impersonal lifestyle and uh, as I suggest in the, in the introduction that paralleling this transformation is a profound change in worldview in which urban denizens see themselves no longer as part of the human fabric of a shared community based on direct person-to-person -person interaction, but rather as loose ends connected primarily by electronic devices. And I have four headings of my presentation, the first of which is urban neighborhoods, second, apartment life, number three, reclaiming, space. number four, life in, not talk at any length about reclaiming a living space, but instead, I would like to transition to a debt of gratitude I owe to Pagan Sun, the founder of Listen to the City, uh, who uh, we go back to about 15 years in a former uh, creative uh, lifestyle. Um, uh, Unsan was an artist, and she is responsible for the cover image on the volume of trauma literature that Ju Chan and I translated from the University of Hawaii Press about 15 years ago. And I also wish to thank Liz Park, who reconnected me with Unsan five years ago in the summer of 2016 when I had a residence at the Seoul Day, the Gyujanggak International Center for Korean Studies. And it was Unsan who in turn introduced me to the, um, uh, the Okparaji Mao uh, project that she was involved in. And um, at the time, she was uh, sponsoring a series of weekly cultural events involving the residents of the neighborhood. I was privileged to take part in one such event, a bilingual reading of a story by the late great Pagwan So, who lived in Hyunjo Dome nearby. So uh, Unsan, thank you very much. I know you're out there. Uh, I look forward, uh, and thank you Liz Park. I look forward to thanking each of you in person uh, at an early opportunity. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be discussing five works of fiction. Uh, the first one connected with Ok Paraji Mao is Che Man Shik's story, Buryo Jashik, um, which I believe we translated as unfilial wretch in our uh, 2017 volume, um, Sunset, the Che Man Shik reader. Um, that was published in Korea in 1925, so the, the five stories I'm going to discuss are separated by a period of 90 years. And in Buryo Jashik, we see, uh, which is set in Okpara Jimao, 
we see that a mother of the Buddha Jashik is an opium addict who's, um, who's been sentenced to um, the Sade Moon Kyoto So because he's been stealing money to support his morphine habit. So his good mother walks from, presumably from uh, Chalabukto, the Gunsan area where Cheman Sheik is from. She is said to have walked 10 days to save on bus fare. That gets her to Pyeongtaek, and from Pyeongtaek she finally uh, can afford to, um, to take public transportation. But she arrives in Okparajimao with a scrap of paper with an address of a man, a hometown man, who um, runs a boarding house, much like the traditional Yoinsuk and uh, Yoguan in Okparajimao. And I suppose I should remind everybody that Okparaji literally means uh, careful assistance to, to prisoners. So the, the culture is that um, in a prison you don't get proper meals, you don't get warm clothing, that's, uh, that's provided by friends and family. Uh, so imagine uh, friends and family from all over the Korean Peninsula coming to Seoul and reclaiming a space in which they can give um, assistance to, to loved ones, family members, friends who are incarcerated in what, of course, was one of the most notorious symbols of the, of the Japanese colonial period. So uh, a very strong sense of community. Um, I'm sure that Unsan will be talking tomorrow about the um, Yokparajimao project. And um, what I wish to emphasize is that the same sense of community that appears in this story by Cheman Sheik from 90 years ago um, survives in, in, um, in my um, interaction with that, with that campaign. I next want to transition to two stories from the 1970s, which I think show to excellent advantage what a shock it was for individuals to transition from multi-family lodging in the countryside to apartment life in Seoul. And I start with Taine Bang, uh, translated by the late great Kevin O'Rourke as another man's room in, um, and that's available in translation in Modern Korean Fiction, an anthology published by Columbia University Press about 15 years ago. And in this story, we see the protagonist coming back from a long day at work, struggling up to his, um, to his apartment, which um, he refers to as a bang, and um, waiting for his good wife to open the door. He's an old-fashioned kind of guy. He doesn't, uh, he's, got, he's got a keys himself, but he, want, he wants his wife to open the door and say, oh, don't she, oh, what the, oh. But no, she's not there. So he eventually has to go in by himself. And on the way in, he attracts the attention, because he's been pounding on the door, he attracts the attention of other dwellers on his floor. And they profess to have never seen him before, even though they've been there for three years. So, um, and he gets, a, and they get a like response from the protagonist. No, I'm, well, I, I, you're not familiar to me either. So into the apartment he goes and there begins a process whereby he starts hardening up, his limbs start hardening up, and by the end of the story he is no longer animate. And when his good wife does come home, she doesn't see him, she looks in the closet and she finds something that she thought she had lost, and it's a walking stick. So that's the that's uh, Chain Ho's kind of magical realist take on transition from traditional uh, multi multi generational living arrangements to living in one of these sterile apartment buildings. And if any of you have ever seen um, these first examples of apartment buildings with the very steep steps, the the bricks and so forth, and um, I saw one of these, Huang Sun Wan, Sun Sing Nim, uh, used to live in an apartment district across from Chengnyang Ni called the Mijua Pot, and this was 
Um, this was that, that kind of structure. Then the second story, uh, also by the late great Pa Guan So, Talman Pangdo, translated by Ju Chan and myself as identical apartments in uh, our Future of Silence anthology published by Zephyr Press in 2016. And what's significant about this story is that the reclamation process, this also involves moving into a new uh, Western style apartment, but this also involves um, a reclamation in the sense of, uh, of material culture, an emerging middle class, the, um, the uh, neighbor across, across the hall is always up on the latest, the latest fashions, the latest um, material items, and so the narrator is trying to keep up with her. It's in that sense, you might think of it as a kind of keep up with the Kim story. And uh, at the end of the, uh, the, narr the protagonist becomes, who's also the first person narrator, becomes increasingly fascinated with the neighbor's husband. And so one night when the, when the, um, uh, the wife, the neighbor wife, is out of town for a she crosses the hall, sneaks into the apartment, and climbs into bed with the neighbor's husband. And then they consummate the act, and then afterwards, she comes back, looks in the mirror, and thinks, I've just committed adultery, and I feel like a virgin. So what's this all about? So it seems that in her attempt to reclaim, or to claim uh, a life in a new style of living, she has experienced the process, but she feels, she still feels an emptiness. Something is not there. Something remains to be done. Next, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of sequence. I, I meant to, um, I mentioned in, in, in my, um, the draft of my paper, my first impressions of Seoul. I arrived there in February 1978 as a Peace Corps volunteer. And uh, at that time, Peace Corps Korea headquarters was in a six-story building near Kwangwamun called the Kyosu Huiguan. And what I remember about the Kwangwamun area is that it was kind of like an urban village. There were Golmok, which we used to refer to as walking streets because it was very unusual for us, even at that time, to see um, uh, rights of way uh, alleys that uh, the only wheeled vehicles were bicycles and pull carts. And so I remember there was a Teppo Cheap right behind the, um, what's now the, um, the Munhua Huiguan, um, that, that big, huge, uh, ugly building. But there was, a, there was a strong sense of community. There were, there were Yoinsuk there. I think we could spend a, we could, we could purchase a private room for 3,000. It was shared room, it was 2,000. We could get a meal, a pokempop for I think 251. And that reminds me of another significant story. It takes place nearby, um, near Mugyodong, but this is Pak Tewan's um, uh, Ibao Soe Sonyan, the, the barbershop boy, which is one of the uh, sketches in his link story novel, Chan Bian Pungyang, which I think of as Streamside Sketches. And this particular story, I had the honor of translating with another mentor of mine, the late Kim Jong-un. What's significant about this story is uh, a distinction being made between inner and outer. So if you read a Korean short story, a uh, current Korean short story, likely it'll be a first-person narrative that takes place inside the head of the first-person uh, narrator. Um, Jo jung -ne says that writers these days have forgotten how to write a third-person narrative. But the point is, this story starts out in a barber shop with a man named Min Chusa, who is sitting in the barber chair, and he's worrying, he's running for, for election, and he's got a young concubine, and he's worrying about his, his stamina. And so he, everything is, is inside his mind, but then abruptly, uh, remember that Pak Taewon was an experimental writer. The point of view uh, shifts to the barbershop boy, and with the barbershop boy, 
Everything is the opposite. Everything is external. He's looking outside. He's looking at all the, uh, he's looking at the shops. He's looking at people he knows. He's wondering, oh, I wonder, he's seeing a, 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 a young couple, both educated. Oh, I wonder if they're going to be able to get married. And so what we see here is a rare example of empathy. He's not looking in, he's not concerned about his, um, about his young concubine. He's concerned about, about the neighbors, the denizens of the, um, of the uh, Chungaychan area. So finally, um, I'm going to, we're going to go up to the present day to a story from a uh, Kongpo Munak um, anthology. And this is a story called Chut Chulun and by, uh, by Zhang and Ho, and it was published very recently in Azalea Journal of Korean Literature and Culture, published by the Korean Institute at Harvard, translated by one of my students, Sophia Choi, and myself. The, the, the focus here is on what the, 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 the Seoul metropolis has become. And in this story, it's futuristic, um, his first day at work, he's come up from the countryside, his good mother has come with him, see him off, first day at work, goes to this big, huge skyscraper, he's way up on some floor, he expects to see a bustling office with other people. No, it's an empty room except for a desk, a telephone, and an intercom. And it turns out that he has come to work at a, at a company that apparently schedules executions of people, but it's all done one phone call. I'm instructed to tell you this. N another phone call to somebody else. And at the end of the story, he is confronted with a dilemma. He has been issued a gun and he has been ordered to shoot and kill a young woman who turns out to have been a uh, grade school classmate of his back home. If he doesn't, well, his good mother has been contacted by the company and invited to come into the company to see what, his, what her son is doing in his first day of work. That's how the story ends. So, uh, conclusion, what's next? I think we can expect to see further indications of trauma, and this is something that Ju Chang have been interested in for about 15 years. We'll see further indications of trauma literature, especially connected with Hale Chosun, the Seoul metropolitan area, uh, in which, as I think we all know, uh, South Korea has the highest suicide rate of the OECD countries, a negative birth rate, the last I heard, a 30% divorce rate. It's uh, representations of human trafficking. Uh, Kim Sogwa's novel, Terror A. Shi, for example, all of which reminds us whether we are urban activists, artists, writers, translators, scholars, that there is much to be done if we are to reclaim the city as a worthwhile place in which to live, work, and create. Thank you. I am Christina Horn, and I will be presenting on Running Man today and the possibilities that it gives us for thinking about soul and urban spaces in general. Since its premiere on SBS in 2010, Running Man has become not only the longest running variety television show in South Korea, but also one of the most popular television programs to come out of South Korea. I, mean, I guess aside from Squid Game at this point. Um, SBS categorizes Running Man as the quintessential real game variety show, which consists of seven or eight cast members who go through eccentric and extraordinary game missions at South Korea's landmarks to win a victory in each game. Often, Running Man's core cast members are split into teams and are joined by celebrities who take part in the games as well. The winning team's victory is typically not associated with a monetary or material reward, but rather just the title of winner and the bragging rights associated with it. While Running Man is an urban variety show, it incorporates multiple different genres within its formats. Uh, according to Kyung Han Kim and Tian Lee, the show became popular for its mixture of genres, combining elements of talk shows, sketch comedy, batsu, or Japanese-style punishment games, and sporting competitions. The show also defies certain conventions of traditional television as it destabilizes the conventional distinctions between the contestants, the hosts, the producers, and the crew. 
in that at any time, any of them may appear in front of the camera or on the show. In this way, Running Man goes against the audience's expectations about who is supposed to be in front of the camera and who is supposed to be behind the camera. However, Running Man not only destabilizes the cast and the crew of the show, but it also destabilizes the urban setting of the show and conventions of play as well. I will examine how the show incorporates aspects of play, playfulness, and psychogeography as a means of derigidifying and destabilizing the functionalism of the urban city. Through the use of play within retail and tourist spaces, Running Man challenges and momentarily subverts the boredom and the alienation of the urban landscape. In this way, the show allows for a reimagining of new forms of pleasure and leisure from within the city itself. At its core, Running Man is an urban variety show based around games and plays uh, and play. The play within Running Man encompasses many of the characteristics associated with traditional play theory, um, such as the theories of Johan Huizinga and Roger Kaiwa. However, within play theory, I want to examine Running Man through Miguel Sicart's uh, contemporary theorizations of play and playfulness. Sicart proposes that play is not only pleasurable, but it is carnivalesque in that it appropriates events, structures, and institutions to mock them and trivial realize them. And through this, we express ourselves taking over the world to laugh at it and make sense of it too. Play though is not just a means of experiencing pleasure, but for Sigart, play is also fundamental to human life and that it frees us from moral conventions, but makes them still present. So we are aware of their weight, presence, and importance. We need play precisely because we need occasional freedom and distance from our conventional understanding of the moral fabric of society. While Running Man incorporates all of these aspects of play, there is also a sense of playfulness within the show as well. Although playfulness can exist within play, they are not synonymous and that play is an activity and playfulness is an attitude. Playfulness by Sicard's definition is a physical, psychological and emotional attitude towards things, people and situations. It is a way of engaging with the world derived from our capacity to play, but lacking from some of the characteristics of play. Therefore, one can be playful outside of play in the same sense that one can play without being playful. However, in the case of Running Man, playfulness is often incorporated within their play and works to destabilize the rigidity of their games. In this way, Running Man is not only playful, but incorporates aspects of what Sicart terms as dark play, and that players of a game are playful when they consciously manipulate the relative rigidity of the system. Dark play is used as a playful approach to play situations in which the disruptive nature of play can be used to break the conventions of gentrified play context. Running Man not only destabilizes the convention of play, but uses this to further destabilize its setting and the city as well. Running Man's setting for play and playfulness almost always involves the urban landscape of which whatever city the episode takes place in. While Running Man itself centers around play and games, it does not always take place in a play space, nor does it always take place in a game space. Rather, Running Man often takes place on either the streets of the city or within tourist and retail spaces. In this way, utilizing psychogeography in addition to play theory allows for a better understanding of how space functions and Running Man as a means to derigidify the urban landscape. Psychogeography, which is the study of the behavioral and emotional effect of geographical environment on individuals, is part of the larger school of situationist theory, uh, which, according to Sadie Plant, characterized modern capitalist society as an organization of spectacles, a frozen moment of history in which it's impossible to experience real life or, act or actively participate in the construction of the lived world. It argues that the alienation fundamental to class society and capitalist production has permeated all aspects of social life. Uh, Amy J. Elias notes that situationist theories like Guy Debord uh, sought a liberatory mode of urban being that defied the alienation of capitalism. Elias also notes that the relationship between play and psychogeography, that play for the situationist theories took on a post-structuralist anti-logocentric quality for it meant both the free play of the imagination and the overturning of closed logical categories associated with the spectacle and ideological master narratives. The situation constructed by Derive and de Tournament uh, resituated participants in a renewed libidinal space. And reinventing physical space was the means of reinventing leisure, but it was also the means of renewing perception and thus radically challenging the alienation and boredom gen generated by the capitalist spectacle. These characteristics of play within situationist theory can be related to the aforementioned theorizations of play. In the same way that Running Man's play is pleasurable, it also reinvents physical space in such a way that momentarily defies the boredom and alienation associated with the urban landscape of a city. 
In terms of reinventing physical space, Running Man is predominantly shot in retail and tourist spaces. Psychogeography itself has been utilized by scholars and retail studies in order to reconceptualize retail spaces and retail tourism. Charles McIntyre notes that the activity of tourist and retail shopping goes beyond mere functional purchasing into multi-sensory explorations of place and space. Uh, McIntyre notes that tourist and retail spaces align with the core aspects of psychogeography and that tourist and leisure environments support the behaviors of the flaneur and their associated uh, activities of derive and, and detournement, all situated in the commercial public spaces of a society of consumerist spectacle. In this way, retail spaces in particular allow for leisurely movement and pause outside of the functionalism associated with shopping. McIntyre highlights that retail specifically aimed at tourism is dealing with a bordering transitional so-called liminal region between the sacred and the secular, the mundane and the exotic and the local and the global. This liminality of the act of tourism extends into the real retail spaces, creating liminal and autonomous leisure, leisure realms. The liminality of these spaces and their shift away from economic essentialism allows for Running Man to set episodes within these places that enhance the potential for leisure and playful, playfulness. This liminality between the local and the global is not only seen within the setting of Running Man, but also the history of the, the show itself. It did not become an overnight success in Korea. Even cast members like Haha ha will admit that the success of Running Man is attributed to their international audience. Following the immense popularity of Running Man in China, the format of Running Man was bought by a Chinese network and became the most successful remake of a Korean originated entertainment program. Therefore, not only did the show utilize urban spaces on both the local and the global level, but the format of the show itself became applicable both locally and globally. I now wanna focus on episode 186 of Running Man to examine how the show destabilizes the urban landscape while incorporating playfulness and play. Episode 186, or Faces of Soul, originally aired February 28th, 2014, and starred the Running Man cast who were joined by actress uh, Shim Eun Kyung and all four band members of CN Blue. The cast members and celebrities were divided into three teams, the red team, blue team, and yellow team, and were designated as cultural delegates of Seoul who must run around the city and complete missions at certain cultural landmarks in order to win medals that, might, that will help them with the final challenge of the show. Whichever team wins the final challenge will win the title of the representative of Seoul for a year. The first mission takes place at Guangzhou Market and involves Oop, apologize. <laughs> it involves uh, teams eating traditional Korean foods at different stations throughout the market. Once the team has finished eating the food at a station, they are offered a plate with five upside down cards. If they pick the correct card, they will stop eating, receive a certain number of medals based off of their time and head to the second challenge location. However, if they pick any of the wrong cards, they must move to a different station in the market and eat a different food until they either run out of stations or pick the correct card. Quickly, the teams realize that if they pick the wrong card every time, uh, they can stay within the market and eat free food for hours and delay taking part in the other challenges. This leads to the teams actively hoping to fail and even cheering when they pick the wrong card. The second uh, challenge location that the, the competitors move to is Namsan Tower, where they are met by a swarm of fans. This mission utilizes all of these onlookers, though, by requiring each team to recruit a certain number of onlookers in order to take a picture. Many of the volunteers that they recruit include foreign tourists, elementary school children on a field trip, and fans who travel to Namsan in order to watch the filming. Once a team has successfully taken their picture, they receive medals based off of how they placed and can move on to the third location. The third mission takes place at a famous uh, street called Gwanghwanmun Hangul Gaungil. Contestants are required to collect Hangul characters in order to spell out Hunmin Jonggum, the first document written in Hangul. The contestants race around the streets looking for the characters and chase each other in order to steal film characters from each other. The contestants wrestle one another and fight over the characters as occasional passerbys try to avoid them and watch in confusion. The contestants must race to put their characters on boards right next to the, the statue of King Sejong and are then awarded medals based off of how they placed. The fourth mission takes place at a shopping mall in Seoul. The contestants race around the mall looking for boxes that have pieces of paper with the name of a game that the contestants can later pick to play. 
Once all of the teens find two boxes, they convene in the middle of the cosmetic section of the shopping mall. They are told that they will play against each other in these games and will be getting the medals that they previously won um, in order to um, previously won on the games and the winning teams at the end will receive advantages in the final challenge that will take place on the roof of the mall. The games that they play are childish in nature and include a pop-up pirate game, a game called Titanic, and a coin stacking game. Shortly after these games, the show cuts to the final mission, which takes place on the roof. All of the contestants are standing next to a giant roulette wheel, um, and it is revealed that the yellow team lost the ability to take part in the final challenge since they lost all of their medals when they were betting on the final coin stacking game. The giant roulette wheel is divided into 100 sections and the contestants are told that they will receive colored stickers equivalent to the number of medals they have remaining and put those on the wheel. They will then spin the wheel and whatever color the wheel lands will be the winner of today's episode. Both the blue team and the red team have 25 medals each and agree to give the yellow team one medal from each of their teams so that they can participate in the roulette spin and therefore give the yellow team a two out of 100 or 2% chance of winning. Ultimately, though, the blue team, which consists entirely of the four members of CM Blue, wins and they are awarded the title of the Faces of Soul for Running Man uh, for 2014. The theme of episode 186 is tourism, which as previously noted, suggests a sense of liminality, both locally and globally, that aligns with psychogeography's reimagining of the urban city. While the play within Running Man cannot be categorized as a uh, derive, there is a connection between dark play, playfulness, and detournement that underlies Running Man. The episode itself features play that does not award a monetary prize and is therefore unproductive. Its play does fit within Sikart's characterization of play as not only pleasurable for both the players themselves and the audience, but also carnivalesque in that it appropriates the urban landscape and makes it comical. These car this carnivalesque aspect of play that appropriates structures and uses them outside of their intended function draws parallels to how detournement in psychogeography involves a hijacking and repurposing of a structure outside of its banal function within the spectacle. While a detournement is more political and self-reflexive in nature, Running Man does destabilize the spectacle of the urban landscape and suggests a reimagining re of the city outside of its intended function under capitalism. This is especially seen within the fourth mission when contestants run around a shopping mall searching for boxes, which will then lead them to play children's games in the middle of the mall's cosmetic section. Additionally, the contestants on Running Man destabilize the rigidity of the play they are expected to take part in through playfulness and dark play. As seen in the first mission in Guangzhou Market, even when the contestants use spaces in the way that they are intended, in this case, eating food at a food market, they introduce a playfulness that goes against the rules of the play and the game that they are taking part in. Although contestants are supposed to hope they draw the correct card so they can move to the next mission, they instead begin actively hoping that they pick the wrong card and cheer when they fail to follow the intentions of the game or when they fail to win. As previously noted, Running Man actively works to destabilize the distinctions between production members, cast members, celebrities, and fans. Episode 186 does this not only by integrating celebrities within the teams of cast members and showing production members explaining the games to contestants, but also through having fans and onlookers participate in missions as well, especially in the case of the second mission at Namsan Tower. However, Running Man also shows how the setting and format of the play can be destabilized as well through the use of dark play. Although Running Man still takes place within the normal conventions and urban spectacles of South Korean society, as Sikart suggests, this play provides a form of occasional freedom and distance from these moral conventions within the weekly hour and a half format of the show. While this is occasional and impermanent, it, also, it at least allows for the audience to momentarily view the city, play, moral conventions, and the medium of television itself in a more liminal and leisurely way. Therefore, the show suggests a way of reimagining the urban landscape from within the capitalist spectacle that allows for forms of unconventional play and leisure. It imagines Seoul as a city that is liminal and pleasurable for South Koreans who are otherwise grappling with the extreme functionalism of late capitalism. Thank you. Thank you so much to our three pre presenters. My name is Ginny Kim Watson, and I'm just going to make some brief um, comments ask a couple of questions and then we'll we'll go open it up to Q&A. Um, I also want to thank the organizers um, for this terrific conference. Um, it's a real honor to be here um, as part of the conversation um, and I really enjoyed the, the wonderful morning panels. 
of course, in this panel, we've shifted from discourses and practices of architecture itself to questions around representations of the city, urban depictions in literature, to futurist architectural imaginings, and a popular contemporary TV show. Um, so also, I just want to remind the audience, use this time to think of your own questions. So um, in about 10 minutes, we'll turn to the um, audience questions. So first, um, Bruce's paper gave a, a wonderful, rich overview of how literature documents the social experiences of urban transformation in Seoul over a, over a, a, a large um, swath of modern Korean history. His presentation took us from the urban forms of colonial modernity, experiences of rapid industrialization, to urban renewal, social competition, and finally, the often alienating effects of skyscrapers and apartment living. There's a long literary tradition in modern literature more generally of the city as both a space of freedom and constraint. On the one hand, the city as a realm of freedom, a space of modernity, of opportunities for advancement and self-fashioning. On the other, the city as a space of alienation, exploitation, and loss of authentic communities. Uh, and of course, the title of your paper was From Community to Anonymity. So it sort of tracks a historical arc, um, I think, from the, the positive uh, values of community and authenticity to their loss. So I wanted to ask you a little bit to, to speak a bit more about how you see the configuration of modern Korean literature structured both by this perhaps ambivalent desire for urbanism and its alienating experiences. So on the one hand, all roads lead to Seoul. The injunction implies that one cannot not want to go to Seoul. And yet the city is also this the site of um, intolerable urban competition, Hel Joseon, um, density and so forth. Um, and relatedly, I wondered how you might view literature as also allowing us to see the creations of new forms of, of social collective life, uh, forms of solidarity and so forth. Uh, second, Professor Shin, this was such a fascinating paper on the future exhibition hall in the Korean Pavilion at the 1970 Osaka Expo by Kim Sugun and his team. Um, and of course, we heard a lot about um, other other projects um, by the architect earlier today. Um, I was really fascinated by the way the pavilion uses architecture as a way to imagine a fundamentally reorganized economic, urban, social, and cultural way of life. And as you point out, this is done in a way that responds to the imminent pressures of contemporary society, of urban growth, of urban concentration, resource depletion, and environmental degradation. Um, so I think there's a lot of resonances with our current urban crises as well. The project reminded me of historian Reinhard Koselleck's notion of futures past and the, the value of looking back at those futures that were imaginable at certain moments in the past. My first question was is sort of a perhaps a minor one. I, I'm not sure it was sort of just struck me um, that in the project, especially the description of the mechanized urban um, sort of central infrastructure spine, that it was fascinating that it of course it's it spanned both North and South Korea, as you mentioned, it went from Pyongyang um, to Daejeon. And I just thought that was so striking for at that moment what was what was obvious perhaps was that the country would be reunited by the year 2000 and I just wondered if that was controversial in the particular you know Cold War moment the exhibition being in Japan and so forth my second question is about the concept of the primitive or the one song as you discuss it um, as you as you mentioned it's a really provocative term you suggested a, as a response to the dehumanizing impact of industrialization and modernization but of course, when we look about the look at the design, it seems anything but primitive. So I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about primitive, how it relates to the concepts of third space and womb space that you mentioned. And finally, Christina, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed your presentation and appreciated um, the way your analysis of Running Man um, explores it from a number of different angles, the blurring of genre conventions. And especially you're thinking through theories of play, psychogeography, and situationist practices. I was most interested in your reading of the TV show as rejecting the norms of spatial use in productivist terms or capitalist terms. That is your emphasis on the urban landscape as 
uh, in the show as, as pleasurable and economically unproductive. As you say, it suggests a reimagining of the city outside its intended function under capitalism. I wonder if I could uh, push you to say a little bit more about that, since it also seemed to me that the show's use of tourist spots, of malls, of celebrity participants, and with SBS being a major commercial broadcaster that I believe is owned by a construction company, um, I was wondering, you know, can we, can we really think of it as, as totally escaping the logic of productivity or the consumption of spectacle? Um, and then a, a second part of the question, if, if we have time, is I, I wondered what the specific historical development of Seoul might have to say back to those theorists of play, of psychogeography, of derive. Um, for example, leisure and tourism have quite a different history in Seoul, and how would that history inflect the way that we think about those predominantly Euro-American theories? Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question, Professor. Watson. Uh, so the future of literary representations of the metropolis. Um, we are, as, as I mentioned, in the new millennium, we, the production of fiction has shifted very much to first-person narratives that take place in the interior landscape. But there are some exceptions, and I could cite a, a story collection by Yoon Go Eun called Eden Yong Shik Tang, a Shik Tak, literally Table for One, which uh, the title story of which is about a, um, a course that um, teaches individuals how to eat by themselves in a restaurant without, without getting panic attacks. So uh, you're, you're probably familiar with um, this, this uh, so-called hon, uh, from honja culture, honsu, entertaining oneself, drinking by oneself, um, activities that were unimaginable um, a couple of decades ago. We also see as I mentioned, representations of, of, of Hel Chosun. I think we're going to see more and more works about the, the social ills that um, have characterized the Seoul metropolitan area, uh, in my view, since the IMF crisis. Um, I, I believe I mentioned something in my paper about my, my own take on the uh, the IMF crisis, I had just begun my second semester at Seoul Day, and I was living in a residence called the Gukche Huiguan uh, in Dongsung Dong near the former um, location of Seoul National University. And as I always did, I would get up before dawn and go out on the play field of a nearby middle school that was associated, I think, with the, with the Seoul Day School of Education. It was still dark, and, um, but I saw something very unusual. There are these masses of people uh, kind of shuffling about, but they were completely silent. They weren't saying anything. And then eventually, uh, dawn broke and a man went up on the platform from which the school principal does his johe, his um, morning assembly, and I realized that this was a social welfare worker addressing dozens of men who had lost their jobs. And this is when I also began to see street side soup kitchens on um, Daehanmyo University Boulevard. So um, increasingly we see representations of, of social ills, but just by a few writers, but I think we're going to see more and more now that genre fiction has kind of perhaps begrudgingly been accepted by the 
elite, conservative, and patriarchal Korean literature establishment, the Mundan. I think we're going to be seeing more and more representations of Seoul in, um, in, in so-called horror literature in, uh, and also in science fiction. And one interesting aspect of SF writing in Korea is that most of the writers who are gaining attention are female and they are adept not only at addressing uh, issues of technology, quahak, but also focusing on what the effect of those developments uh, have done for human relations. So I, I think this is a very significant development. I think Kim Sagwa, whom I mentioned earlier, will be seeing more from her. She's very concerned about life in the city. And I think that's everything that comes to mind, but it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jong Hun, would you like yeah. to respond? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for um, the question. You know, actually, I, I think I try too much to work uh, in, the, in the limited time. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I just I want to uh, answer your s second question firstly. So the primitive, yeah, right, yeah, absolutely. Um, the their architecture design, there there is not mm, not much um, the primitive uh, feature uh, in their architecture uh, design. But I think is um, I didn't. Uh, speak to the primitive in, in this con in this presentation, but the, their concept of primitive is quite uh, uh, influenced by um, uh, Marshall Macron, uh, Marshall Macron concept of primitive and primeval con uh, spatial conception. So the uh, Marshall for Marshall Macron, the new electronic environment of networks and, and computation extends and not a single organ of the human body as the nervous system itself. So uh, everything is connected. So that's why the space become visceral, um, the substance rather than being empty. So the Macron believe this new environment returned the electronic man to a primitive or primeval conception of space. The space is uh, full of um, the, the cosmic forces and cosmological view of spaces, space. So I think so. The Korean architect uh, were drawn to this kind of um, the spatial concept. Um, the space is full of um, the cosmic power, or, or the the charges uh, with the psychological and cultural stimuli. So they adopted this kind of concept to design. Uh, the, the the future hall itself it was very darkened um, the uh, room uh, rectangular room uh, where the uh, the bombardment of visual collage uh, generated no narrative only to uh, charge only to saturate uh, the viewer uh, and 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 generate some somatic uh, experience so so uh, actually the future hall was designated as cool environment um, concept uh, following Macron's terminology. So the primitive means is the kind of some, um, the, uh, the, the, spa the, the spatial concept of um, the space uh, uh, becomes uh, quite uh, uh, visceral and, 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 and quite a sensuous, uh, the, the spa spatial concept they uh, want to uh, deliver. Uh, so that was um, the, uh, connected and uh, related to the um, Kim Sugun's um space, third space, and uh, ultimate space. And the first question is uh, it's very uh, interesting uh, question, um, and thank you for uh, for bringing up this question. Yeah, even if, uh, all, although um, the Korean architect uh, include uh, the North Korean uh, the territory uh, in their uh, utopian vision, but it was utopian. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the literally uh, no, it's it's it's, it's um, utopian. But the, although they want to, they um, they incorporated uh, the North Korean uh, territory, but their 
uh, focus uh, uh, goes on to uh, the, the metropolitan area around Seoul. So, um, they, uh, so the most of their report uh, focused on how they organized uh, the, the, the national territory of South Korea. Uh, they, uh, even though they, um, they pay uh, rip service uh, to the North Korean uh, uh, the territory. So I, I, I have not much idea about under what circumstances uh, they, um, they, they in, in the incorporation of North Korea in their utopian concept. And I, I, I try to, I, uh, that is the uh, further research uh, required to understand uh, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, the question of is this totally escaping capitalism? I had that question before I even started writing this because the answer is no, right? Like it's never going to completely escape this or subvert it or show a perfect possibility outside of capitalism within this. Um, I don't think film or television really has that capability within Korea, especially with chaebol conglomerates being so invested in film production and television productions that I don't think we can ever completely have like a anti-capitalist television show, um, especially on SBS of all places. But I was thinking in terms of like this non-production that's presented, right? Like, of course they don't, you know, do this for free, right? All the cast members are paid. Um, there's a ton of money that's invested in this, but I'm thinking more so along like the representations of play of like, we've hit this point of such late capitalism, but it's now turned in on itself of like, this glorification or this like uh, uh, winning children's games on television. Um, I know it was very interesting to think of this in terms of Squid Game, which I have been thinking a lot about lately, just in terms of like hitting this point of, of so much, you know, capitalism and oppression that comes from that and reverting back to children's games as a way of trying to escape this, whether you can or not is another question in and of itself. Um, so yeah, the answer is no, this isn't going to, to fully escape it, but I do think it shows a possibility of thinking about the city in a way that's a bit more unconventional, um, that shows a way of leisure and pleasure that isn't associated with labor and production. Um, and it has that possibility, even if in and of itself, it doesn't fully escape that. Um, so I think, you know, that's the short answer of it is that, you know, I see possibilities there. I think thinking of it in terms of history would be an interesting way to go about this as well. Um, but I think that is something that I could develop a bit more with that idea. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we have some questions from the audience and I'm going to read out one question for each of the panelists and then we'll sort of do one more round just to make sure we get time. So it's a question from Mike Robinson at Indiana University for Bruce Fulton. Um, the question is, Fulton shows represent representatives to present an alienating and negative image of the city. Can he comment on alternative or more hopeful um, or liberating representations of urban life? So I guess we're wondering, yeah, if, we, if there are any more sort of um, uh, liberating or positive representations. Um, for Chong Hoon, there's a question from uh, Gayen Park, University of Michigan. How did Kim Sugun envision human experiences or human agency in his idea of futuristic architecture? And then uh, a question from Professor Yong Ju Ryu from Michigan for Christina. Does your analysis about play and destabilization of the rigidity of urban um, geography and space apply to Running Man's precursor? precursors like Infinite Challenge or its rival program, uh, One Night, Two Days. Um, if this analysis applies to these other games, what do you think accounts for the particular appeal of Running Man? Um, so perhaps we can go again, Bruce, Chong Hoon, and Christina. Thank you. Mike was kind enough to share his question with me um, before my presentation, so I've had, a, I've had a little bit of time to think about the answer, uh, and he's very succinctly shortened the question too, can anonymity be liberating? And in some cases, yes, and again, I will cite Kim Sagwa, whose second novel titled Puri Numnanda, based on the poem by Kim Soo Young, involves a young woman from a 
rather well-to-do family with a, a um, successful older sister who decides to kind of break out of that um, break out of that routine and uh, falls in love with a penurious uh, artist. So in that sense, uh, anonymity is a bit liberating, but it ends badly because the artist ends up uh, taking his own life. In other cases, anonymity is a survival strategy. And here I'm specifically thinking about Kim Soom's novel Han Myung, the very first Korean novel to focus exclusively on the so-called comfort women of the Pacific War, in which the protagonist, a nameless woman in her early 90s, occupies a kind of ghost neighborhood in Seoul, one of the many neighborhoods that's up for redevelopment, and she is kind of a proxy for her nephew who lives in, I believe, Suwon, outside of Seoul, and he is using her to maintain residence so that he can obtain priority for residence in the new housing that will go up. So in her case, she is, she is not reported her history as a, as a so-called comfort woman. She is living a shadow existence as a survival strategy so that uh, she will not be subject to the misconceptions to which uh, several of the other uh, registered comfort women subjected, being, being filthy, et cetera, et cetera. But at the very end, she makes a fateful decision. At the very end, there is only one surviving comfort woman left. She is on her deathbed in the university hospital, and she decides, the protagonist, decides to go visit her. And on her way to the hospital in public transportation, she has an epiphany. And the, epif the epiphany is the reclamation of her own name, which she has not used for 70 years. And this epiphany allows her to reclaim agency. It allows her to reclaim an existence which has been a shadow existence, it continues to be a shadow existence in this um, redeveloping neighborhood in Seoul. And by doing so, she is returning herself from anonymity to historical memory. Thank you. Um, seeing as we're running a little bit short on time, we'll move to John then. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you. Good question. Um, yeah, actually, the Korean architect, uh, including Kim Soo Geun, uh, thought um, the mechanization and urbanization posed uh, the threat to humanity. So they want to, uh, so they want a kind of some shelter of humanity, uh, which protected from rapidly changing and possibly endangered society. So that's why they um, the emphasize the primitive. Uh, the primitive means kind of some the protection uh, from the urbanization and mechanization. So, so the Kim Soo Geun uh, imagined that some space should be uh, um, the something uh, irrational, visceral, or uh, coincidental uh, come into play to stimulate uh, the creativity and humanity. So they want to make a, 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 a kind of a, a, a architecture, uh, the, or build some architecture that uh, to uh, by which to uh, stimulate creativity, humanity, and and the reclaim and the human agencies that was uh, seem to be threatened by mechanization and, and, and urbanization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Christina. 
Yeah, thinking about Running Man in relation to other shows is interesting. I'll try to group in my thoughts with the other question that I have in the Q&A as well, is that I think fan culture of Running Man plays a huge part in terms of its popularity. Um, thinking about how the urban space um, functions in other shows like Infinite Challenge and One Night Two Days, um, you have that there as well, but there's something about the playfulness within Running Man that I think is unique to it, it's especially in terms of the ways in which these games take place at things that can be found anywhere in the world that aren't necessarily specific to Korea, I think is something that helps with the with the fan culture around it. There's so much on social media in terms of people going to malls or to museums and playing the games that they see on Running Man and kind of reproducing that in such a way that takes it a little bit outside of Korea in that sense, especially because the popularity of it came from outside of Korea um, uh, a lot more so. Um, if I'm thinking in terms of infinite challenge and the rigidity of the urban um, there as well, um, typically when I think more so of infinite challenge, it seems like a lot of, of more skits. And of course, there's like the improv and improv that comes with it um, a bit more that um, is interesting to think of in this. Um, trying to think. This is a really good question. It's stumping me a little bit in terms of, of thinking of this. But if I was to say why I think Running Man excels uh, more so globally than other Korean sh variety shows in this kind of strain, I really do think that the fan culture around it, the fact that they go to these other countries, and they went very early on within um, the, the shooting of Running Man, um, to these places and engaging with fans there and shooting in other cities other than Seoul, I found to be um, something that on social media seems to resonate the most. Oh, thank you, Christina. Um, thank you all. I think we, I don't know that we have time for another question. Um, Oh, we'll, oh, we do. Just very briefly, there's one more question in the chat. We have two and a half minutes left. Uh, this question is also for Christina from John Grisafi at Yale. Um, do you think that the usage and presentation of certain spaces in Running Man could serve as a reification of some kind of cultural or national sacrality of these spaces and their journeys to them perhaps a form of pilgrimage? Um, so I guess the question is about this idea of cultural sacrality sacrality, sacredness um, to the spaces in the show. Yes, so uh, as I was kind of touching on a little bit prior to this, like these tourist spots are, are picked very intentionally. A lot of them are named, especially within the episode that I'm looking at. Uh, they know that these are not only popular tourist spots, but they will also attract more people to go there. There is a sense of nationalism that comes with that, of course, especially the episode that I'm looking at that is completely centered around um, the cultural faces of Korea. So I think there is that aspect of that. Um, there have been multiple videos that I have seen on YouTube of people visiting places that they've seen either Running Man or Korean dramas being cast at, and they go there and they reproduce the things that they saw on the show. They'll act out scenes. Um, so I do think that there is this fan culture around it. If I would say that it is, I'm not sure if I would say sacred. Um, I know, John, that you are in religious studies, and that is not my realm of uh, study. But I think that there is some potential there. There's something about fan culture um, that I think could be tapped into and looked at in that perspective. Um, but I think, yes, there is something there that holds like a, a nationalistic aspect to it. Terrific. Well, perfect timing. Um, thank you, Bruce, Chonghun, and Christina for a really wonderful panel. Um, so thanks again. Thank you.